everybody, and welcome to the Aspen Author webinar series. Today's topic is how formulas help legal writers and legal readers. But before we begin, I have a few quick housekeeping items to review. First off, the audio for this webcast is through your internet only, so I do recommend using a headset or earbuds or listening to this presentation through your laptop or mobile speakers. Secondly, this is indeed a one-way communication channel. You can hear us, but we cannot hear you. So if you do have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat feature. And now I will hand it over to Natalie to introduce today's presenter. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Natalie Danner, Editorial Director at Aspen Publishing, and it's my pleasure to introduce Mary Beth Beasley. Mary Beth Beasley is a professor of law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, William S. Boyd School of Law. She has taught legal writing for over 35 years and has held numerous leadership positions in legal education, including president of the Legal Writing Institute, chair of the ABA's Communication Skills Committee, and president of the Association of Legal Writing Directors. Her previous academic appointments include faculty positions at Vermont Law School, the University of Toledo, and the Ohio State University College of Law. Professor Beasley is the co-author of Legal Writing for Legal Readers and Briefs and Beyond, and author of A Practical Guide to, Legal, to Appellate Advocacy, which has just published in its sixth edition. She's also contributed a chapter to the compilation of The Law of Harry Potter. Her current scholarship focuses on behavioral aspects of legal writing and legal reading, and on the impact that digital platforms have on cognitive aspects of legal writing. Please join me in welcoming Professor Beasley to the Aspen Author Webinar Series. The floor is yours. All right. Hello, my computer, because that's what I'm seeing. Um, uh, I wish we could all be in the same room together, but I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, attend this webinar. And uh, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, my quick overview, I'm going to talk, I'm going to show some of the formulas I plan to talk about and then talk about how I really got into using formulas, um, both my inspiration and the theoretical foundations. And then my plan is to illustrate as many as I have time to. Um, uh, we're going to leave about 15 minutes for a discussion at the end. So Natalie, feel free to just break in and say, hey, I've got a clock here, so I will, I'm trying to follow it uh, as well. But thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate it. So um, uh, this is just a list of some of the formulas that I use regularly with my students. Cracksack, CREAC, we all have used variations on those. Um, I'll be talking about ignore, tell, clarify, prove, meow transitions, and then formulas for topic sentences and case descriptions and the template of reader signals. Right now, I'm sort of doing some beta testing um, uh, uh, for what I'm calling CR paragraphs and a paragraph-based length formula, because I get very tired of my students asking how long, uh, how much, what page limit should I aim for, which that question alone tells you why I hate to answer that question. Uh, and I should also say a lot of the formulas I'm talking about today are things that I've worked on with uh, my co-author, uh, co-author of, that's one of the books that I'm using this semester, Monty Smith at Ohio State. So um, uh, I don't know if Monty is, is listening, but hello, Monty. But if he's not, uh, he and I have worked together for, I think, I think I can say decades now, at least decade. Anyway, so my inspiration, shockingly, that is me in the glasses. Um, about 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, excuse me, when I was a new teacher at Vermont Law School. And I think it worked out very well for my teaching that my very first semester of teaching, I was teaching appellate advocacy to second year students. And I had students who were not doing a good job writing. I'm not talking grammar, I'm talking substance and organization. They were not doing a good job at it. And I thought, they just don't get it. They don't understand the law. They don't understand you know, the issues here. You know, What are you gonna do? Uh, they're just not understanding it. And then fortunately, because it was an appellate advocacy course, we had an oral argument. And not all of the students who were having trouble, but absolutely a critical number of them showed that they absolutely understood the law and they absolutely understood the issues and how the law applied to the facts. And so that told me, I have to figure out a way to communicate to these students an objective binary. Looking back, I think of it as like my Julia Child moment. How can I write a recipe for these folks so that they can understand what the reader needs, what I want them to do as the teacher, 
uh, and what's going on. I have to confess, though, when I look back in 1983, all I'm sure it wasn't true for everyone, but I know what I was teaching was active voice and plain language. We weren't teaching structure and all the many things we teach now. It was early, early days in, in legal writing. So as far as foundational, um, uh, theoretical foundation, ooh, I meant to make that plural, heuristics. It's, it's almost, uh, it's used as a concept as heuristics. It is, I have to say heuristics, a heuristic is a word that I used to bleep over. It was something I had to look up every time I used it. Probably when we think of formulas and when I think of formulas, most of my formulas can be thought of as a heuristic. They are a tool, they are a mental shortcut that, that we use so that we don't have to start from scratch every time we solve a particular category of problem. Some people refer to a, a heuristic as a set of usually useful questions that you answer. Um, there's this, as this definition indicates, there are a few different ways to think about it. But heuristic is a pain in the neck word to say. And when people read it, a lot of people don't know how to read it in their head. So I like formula uh, better for everyday use. Some other theoretical foundations. Um, uh, and the, I, I know I'm citing myself there, but really what I'm saying is read the things I'm citing there. But um, Terry Pullman, who uh, uh, sort of was here, not sort of was here, was actually here at UNLV when I came, this article, if you have not read Building a Tower of Babel or Building a Discipline, so, so useful. And one of the real insights of the article is the value of jargon as a heuristic and the value of jargon uh, as um, a foundation for learning. All right. And, and the other two articles talk about a variety of things, but one of the things is uh, scaffolding and how as teachers, we are trying to provide scaffolding for our students that they can build their learning on. And an image that I, I do a lot, you know how they sink things in the ocean for coral to grow on? Um, from what I know about how learning works and how memory works, one of the very common uh, things that happens uh, with memory is that we attach new information to old information. If there's nothing in our brain to attach it to, it's very hard for us to remember it. And I think coral cannot just grow in the air, it has to grow on something. So that's my analogy and I'm sticking to it. But what I like to do with these formulas, and this is, as I say, it's a type of scaffolding. It's also something that jargon does. It gives our students an anchor on which they can um, grow their learning. And I, and frankly, I think we can grow our learning on that. On that. So just I'm going to start with the, the, the uh, the formula that we all know. And the reason I like it, and I think the coral uh, analogy is a good one, is, you know, when I was in law school, I think I learned IRAC, and now I do CREAC uh, or CREXAC, and I'm gonna use those interchangeably throughout. But we started out with issue rule application conclusion, and then we said, well, wait a minute, in legal writing, we don't wanna start with a mystery story, so we're gonna tell them the conclusion at the beginning. Okay, we'll turn that to CREC. And then we said, well, wait, sometimes there's a gap between the rule and the application. And so we filled that gap with the explanation. And we know some people call it analogous cases, some people call it rule proof. There's a few different ways to talk about it, but a common way we talk about it with CREAC is we call it the explanation of the rule. And then I started seeing my students didn't know a conclusion at the beginning, conclusion at the end, what's going on there. And I started calling the one at the end connection conclusion. My colleague, Monty Smith at Ohio State, started calling the one at the beginning, the thesis conclusion or the conclusion thesis. And so that's just building on the learning we already have there. And I am not going to go through the elements of CREAC because I'm guessing everybody who's watching this already is very, very familiar with them. But I think it's a great example of how we start with a simple formula, that formula grows more sophisticated and each piece of that formula then gets unpacked or has, has uh, I would say almost said barnacles, let's say coral, it's much more beautiful, growing on it, you know, coral of knowledge and of understanding and of complexity. So a lot of people think formula is over is a way to oversimplify. I think it is the foundation on which more complex and more sophisticated uh, uh, thinking can happen. Um, so here is one version, and I have so many as I look here, I think, oh, wait, this doesn't have this, doesn't have that. 
this is me updating. I update this constantly. I call it my math crack sack. And we see along the left-hand margin, the elements. Along the right-hand margin, formulaic articulations of each piece of that um, uh, formula. So it's, it's sort of a meta formula. We have formulas upon formulas. And the benefit, I think, to our students is it gives them to as much as possible, I like to give them times when they can get a yes or no answer. For example, in the rule explanation, I say no client facts go here. In the rule application, I say generally we don't have new cases here. You know, generally we're not referring to new authorities. I can't give a hard and fast rule, but it's providing a scaffolding upon which we can build uh, information and that we can add information to. So as I said, I'm not going to go through this. I know you all know it. Um, uh, so I will continue to um, my next formula. And formula is probably a little bit of a cheating word for this, but this is a, a label, a concept, whatever heuristic that I've been using more recently and that I'm really finding to be useful. And I, I use it when I teach with the National Judicial College and I, I use it with my uh, students, especially my upper level students. And I think it's really helpful. And it is, we think of transitions as being pretty mechanical, but I think that they, they can absolutely uh, fulfill a more sophisticated role, a more complex role in the way our students think and use information and the way our students help their readers. And I, I said, I posted about this on Facebook and I said that Meow Transitions are the love child of Enquist and Oates and Joe Williams. So I'm going to explain that. So, uh, and I'm pretty sure, uh, it wouldn't surprise me, let me put it this way, if Anne uh, uh, was not the main author of this chapter, but I'll, you know, Enquist and Oates is the, is the book. And the chapter on transitions, which I think she calls connections or connections between sentences, she talks about three kinds of transitions. And I know the I, two of them I had sort of found uh, and labeled myself. One is what I think we all think of as transition, mechanical or generic transition. The second that Anne called substantive and that I think of as echo transitions, and don't worry, I'm going to explain all of these. And the third, which I had not thought of or labeled or whatever, that I think is super important for legal writing is what they call orienting transitions. Okay, I'm going to say, hold that for a moment, we'll come back to it. So the other piece of this is Joe Williams's style book. Joe passed away a few years ago, so there's now a co-author. Um, I hate now they make students rent the book and before they're allowed to buy it, I, our library cannot even get a copy of this book. I'm very annoyed in a hard copy. So let me say buying an old edition of this book is not a bad idea. But I want you to look at the top two lines of this uh, illustration, or I should say the top three lines of it. What Joe Williams talks about is we, what is fixed is that our reader will look early in the sentence for the topic and will subconsciously stress what's at the end of the sentence. But he recommends that we can certainly put whatever we want at the beginning of the sentence. In other words, it's variable. But what we should put there is information that is short and simple and familiar. Okay, transitions. Okay, so. It, by putting information that is familiar early in the sentence, we enhance reader comprehension and retention because we give them familiar information that they can anchor new information in the sentence to. And so when you put that concept with the concept of transitions, I think you get to this uh, use of what I call meow transitions. And the problem with too much um, writing of any kind of expository writing, but a big problem if it happens in legal writing is when we don't make connections for the reader. And here is obviously an extreme case. Uh, the issue in this case is whether Socrates is mortal, all core dates die. Accordingly, I conclude that Socrates will expire. So someone reading this would have to remind themselves or figure out that mortality and death and expiring all relate to the same concept. They'd also have to think, well, gee, I guess they're saying that Socrates is a core date, whatever the hell that is. So it's making the reader make all these connections mentally. And of course, as we know, readers won't necessarily do that. So instead, what if you think about transitions, 
you can help the reader make those connections. And it will also, it's not just that you like, when we think of mechanical transitions, okay, well, I'll just stick a word at the beginning of my sentence and then everything will be okay. It sort of often will, if you think of this kind of transition, it can drive content. And so I know this is an incredibly cheesy acronym, uh, too bad. So uh, cheesy is memorable is my uh, theme. So I tell my students, mechanical, echo, and orienting transitions are wonderful, meow. So what we're talking about, mechanical, that's what we think of when we think of a transition. However, in contrast, further. And I have found that if I tell my students they don't have enough transitions or they're not making enough connections, I, I get a draft where every sentence starts with however or further. And I see so many times paragraphs will randomly start with a very mechanical transition because they feel like there has to be something and they don't know what to do otherwise. But the insight that I finally had was I recognized the echo transition that Anne Enquist, as I've said, calls a substantive transition. So the court concluded that Mr. Johnson violated the statute. This conclusion led the court to, you know, put him in jail for a thousand years or whatever. But so many times we see our students write, this led the court, which then the reader has to go, this what? Okay, I guess it must mean the statute or the, you know, the reader has to make inferences. And so by echoing a word from the previous sentence, we connect it. I think I'm supposed to know it's called that a dovetail uh, connection, which is, you know, just again, and that's, we're putting the familiar information at the beginning of a sentence to connect with information in a previous sentence. The third kind, as I said, that uh, uh, is in the Just Writing book that I had never thought of is what they call orienting transitions. And when I was in college, one of the ways you could fulfill your phys ed requirement was to take a course called orienteering, which is they drop you off in the middle of nowhere with a compass and a map and no uh, phone in those days, that was, that was not possible. And you had to get back home and you had to orient yourself. And we think of the way w the Western civilization used to refer to Asia as the Orient. And so it's the East, it's locational. So you wanna think about what are locations that are meaningful in the document. One of them is obviously, you know, physical, geographic, or in law, we would say jurisdictional locations. One is temporal locations and one, label I use, there might be a better one, is what I call intellectual locations. Like the plaintiff might argue, you know, in this case, this happened, you know, there are, there are certainly many more examples of intellectual locations, but just we're trying to let the reader know where they are. And if we think of transition and transit, we're moving the reader through. When you're moving, you want to know where you are. Let's keep this metaphor going. Okay. So what I do when I teach this, I you know, introduce the concept and then I give them this couple of paragraphs and I apologize, I don't have the citation here. It's from an uh, old edition of um, writing and analysis in the law and Betsy Fagin very generously years ago said I could use this uh, in an article where I talked about some other concept, but it's a great example of uh, this kind of use of transitions. Don't worry, I'm not gonna take you through it the way I take my students through it. But I have them say, okay, even though the council was not required to consider alternative sites, it nevertheless did so. The council collected blah, blah, blah. And then I say, okay, do you see any transitions in that second sentence? And eventually they recognize that the council appears in both. And that second sentence starts with familiar information, the council that was in the previous one. And then we go through the whole two paragraphs and we see almost every sentence, oh no, I shouldn't say almost, every sentence has at least one of these transitions of one kind or the other, and a few have a couple. And so we see petitioners uh, underlined in brown, that is the uh, um, orienting transition. The green uh, words are the mechanical. Almost all of the transitions are echo transitions. And I think in a lot of legal writing, echo transitions carry us a long way. I think of legal writing in a nutshell, uh, Marge Rombauer, uh, Marge Rombauer's one of her books, where she said in legal writing, we should use the same word to refer to the same thing and different words to refer to different things. And that obviously is going to help our use of echo transitions. Okay, um, so moving on. Uh, Let's talk about using this as a way to generate content or generate uh, substance in the document. 
So if we see a student has written here, uh, statute blah, blah, allows citizens of different states to sue in federal court. The question here is whether Stifle is allowed to show that he is domiciled, oh man, I have a typo there, embarrassing, even though he was involuntarily removed from Ohio and taken to a Pennsylvania prison. Traditionally, to establish intent, a plaintiff must, blah, blah, blah. So the reader here would be like, okay, what's the connection between domicile and citizens of different states? So I wonder if domicile has anything to do with citizenship. I wonder if intent has anything to do with domicile, but the reader would have to make those inferences. And of course, as we know, the reader will not necessarily do that. So that can, knowing that can generate content. Absolutely, there may be ways to, to write this more succinctly, but here is an example. And I have just gone through and, and underlined the um, uh, almost all substantive transitions. We've got citizens, citizenships, and then we've got in federal court there, we've got an orienting transition. Then we've got domiciled, physically present, intent, stifle. This is stifle's uh, situation. So we're presenting this from stifle's point of view. That's sort of uh, both an orienting and a um, uh, echo transition. But we see that by alerting students to the fact that they should be able to find these echo or substantive connections between sentences, we can help them generate content and both provide meaningful transitions and not just constantly further. It should also be noted that or whatever, but we're going to increase reader understanding by uh, by um, guiding students to fill in those gaps by looking for those meow transitions as they write. And I am a fast talker, as those of you who know me know. So I will say I can see the chat box. If any of you have questions as I go through, I uh, will absolutely, uh, sometimes I might say, oh, I'll get to that later. But if I can, I'm glad uh, to answer questions if anybody has any. All right. The next um, uh um, formula I want to talk about is when students would have a dilemma about how much time should I spend talking about this issue. And I know we have all seen it happen where students will belabor an obvious point. Um, uh, oh, wow, I am that question is beautiful and I'm going to get to that uh, absolutely at the end because I absolutely think uh, Eric has asked, they think CREAC is too formulaic, too simplistic. It hinders learning. Absolutely, uh, it does not. <laughs> and what it does, I would say, it, it provides. Yes, I. Yeah, it provides the scaffolding on which we build. And um, I'm sorry, I cannot delay answering this question. That's too important. I'm going to answer it. Um, that I would. I would. Uh, what I do with my students, and I answer this in. Um, I think I answered it in the books Monty and I have done together, and in my app ad book. Will my writing be boring if I use the same formula? The variety and the creativity come from the substance. You know, uh, there are fabulously creative recipes in cookbooks, even though they all start with the ingredients and then move to the method of putting the ingredients together. And so I think about what's fixed. The reader always wants to know what rule governs the situation. What does the rule mean? How does it apply here? What the rule is, is um, uh, going to vary. It might be a statute, it might be a common law rule, it might be a constitutional provision, it might be an amalgam of all of those, okay? How we explain it, we might look to definitions, we might, uh, uh, we, we might look to case illustrations, uh, which is going to be probably one of the more common ways. There are lots of different ways that we can do it. And then uh, the way we apply it will depend, well, what are the facts in this case? How detailed do we have to be? If it's a statutory interpretation thing, our facts will be the language of uh, a statute rather than, uh, as I like to say, facts that happen in the world. So the variety and the creativity come not from like, oh, I'm going to save the rules so you'll never know when it will appear. Uh, the, the creativity comes from seeing connections that nobody's ever seen before, seeing relationships, seeing law in a way that nobody has ever seen it before. Um, okay, anyway, so next, how much time should I spend talking about this issue? I have come up with um, four labels, but my first step was, well, gee, the more controversial the issue is, the more we need to talk, 
and the more abstract the language is. And I know Sister Llewellyn, one of my algebra teacher, was rolling in her grave when I uh, post this. But if it's very concrete, if, if it's not controversial, I don't have to spend that much time talking about it. That was a little too mushy. So now I have four labels that I use, and I call the labels ignore, tell, clarify, proof. And ignore, you know, the example I always give, DUI, you have to prove it was a vehicle. If it's a Ford Focus, you don't have to spend a sentence saying a Ford Focus is a vehicle under the statute. Um, so you can ignore it. On the other hand, if you have a motorized bar stool, this happened once in Ohio, um, and oh, I know that they've ruled that a motorized bar stool is a vehicle. Okay, I'll spend a sentence on that. A motorized bar stool is a vehicle under the Ohio statute, cite to a case. If this is the first time you've had a motorized bar stool in Ohio, you might have to spend a little time talking about it and you might have to prove it and go into what we would call a CREAC uh, analysis of it. Okay, and I have, brace yourselves, this took me, oh, never mind, it's a slide after this. But this is just an example of a tell issue uh, that I show my students. And on, um, on a sidebar point, this has been so helpful to me uh, in talking to my students about how legal writing and exam writing relate, because I'm sure we all know students who said, I understood everything so well, and then I blew the exam. And a lot of times it's because they thought, I don't have to tell the professor this. She understands it. I don't have to, they know how, you know, they know that why you don't have to address a whistleblower statute here. And I always say, you know, if that's your philosophy, you can write as your complete answer. Well, you know. But by saying, okay, if you're in doubt at all, think of it as a tell issue. If they didn't want you to discuss it, you will have spent only a sentence or maybe two on it. But if they did want you to discuss it, at least you will have hit that issue, okay? So non-controversial issue um, uh, is often a tell analysis. And here is my, um, uh, my flow chart that I'm oh so proud of. And I, you know, can go through it. I don't know how many times my students actually use it, but I used it when I was figuring out how do these pieces fit together. So it can give them some binary questions to answer to help them figure out how should I talk about this? Should I go into a lot of detail? Should I not go into a lot of detail about this? Um, uh, so, all right. Um, oh, I'm so glad to hear someone loves the flowchart. Okay, and now, these next two formulas I often talk about together and I'm going to do it, do it here as well. Um, how much time do I spend talking about authority cases? I'm sure I'm, I'm one of my, um, oh, do I say pet peeve? I have so many pet peeves. I have a menagerie of peeves. Um, th that I think one of the real transitions that students have to make when they are in legal writing and then in clinics and whatever and doing client focused reading and analysis as opposed to um, casebook course uh, analysis. In their casebook courses, when they are reading cases and tell me about this case, they're looking for the main point. And so they will say the main point of this case is, and they'll spend a lot of time and often spend too much time talking about an authority case if they bring that philosophy into their legal writing papers. So I have a formula that I use for what I call case description. I know some other people call them case illustrations. And then this, that's a crappy question. I was trying to think of a question to sort of lead into that. And this is just a formula that I use for the topic sentence or as Monty Smith, my co-author calls it thesis sentences um, uh, in, the, in the rule explanation section. So elements of an effective case description and super, super important to know, and I belabor this uh, a lot in the, in the texts, that the reader should be able to glean these items. It's not that you devote a full sentence to each of these items. What issue are you using this case to illustrate? How did the court dispose of that issue? Very consciously, it doesn't say how, what was the holding. So if it's a negligence issue, and this is a section on breach, I only care what they did about breach. If it's gonna help me understand to say, and therefore they dismiss the case or whatever, fine, it's okay to say that. But I want to know, did if, if this is the section that we're talking about breach, I want to know um, uh, what they say about breach, up or down. Or if it was what I call a kickback case, like a motion to dismiss, like I granted and then is being reversed. The court said there was enough, there were enough facts in the complaint to state a cause of action uh, as to breach. Okay, that's their disposition of breach. They didn't hold that there was or was not breach. 
they held that it met that uh, motion to dismiss standard. And then three, so always, 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 I want to see one and two in a case description. Three, almost always, I want to see. Four, it depends. And very rarely there might be, maybe I'm talking about a bunch of cases that all had similar facts. And, but gee, th this time they helped for the plaintiff with this reasoning, this time they helped for the defendant with this reasoning. There might be times when I would have reasoning without facts. But typically, always going to have issue, always going to have disposition, almost always going to have facts, have reasoning if it's relevant, very rarely have reasoning without facts. I think I just said that twice, sorry. Okay, topic sentences, you know why they're important. I'm going to skip that. But here's the formula. And I have just recently had a little brainstorm on this and, and altered it. Um, uh, phrase of pays, is or is not met, does or does not exist when analogous or disanalogous category of facts from illustrative case exists. And I will say, I tell my students, one of the things we get into fistfights about at the legal writing meetings is how much time do we spend on analogy and distinction in the rule application section? And I am, I am on the uh, shallow end of the pool on that. I find that a little bit of analogy and disanalogy, uh, as Linda Edwards calls it, I think, goes a long way with me. It's a lot of times we don't need to say that out loud. The skill of analogy is super important. And I realize that where they're using that skill, ideally, is in that topic or thesis sentence in the rule explanation section. That's where they're highlighting that connection. And I'll tell you, I don't have a slide on this, but my 1Ls just turned in. In fact, that's, the, that's a pile of papers in my computer that I need to grade. Um, just turned in a, a, a memo on someone who was, want, our client wants to know if they can uh, succeed in a slander cause of action against a department store that falsely accused them of shoplifting. There was a video, a uh, security video, that if they had spent any time looking at it, different clothes, different height, different skin color, they would have obviously known that the person they accused was not the person on the video. One of the authority cases in the state we were in, Mississippi, um, there was one security guard, everybody got a tip, you know, that lady, I think she stole some shoes. One security guard went out, confronted her in the parking lot politely. Um, can I see your bags? Can I look at your shoes? You know, do you have the new shoes? Be, oh my gosh, we're wrong. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And then this other clown runs up and grabs her and drags her back into the store. And so the clown uh, got, got sued for slander. And the court said one of the issues was if the store had probable cause, it was okay for them to make an accusation. And the court said that clown didn't have probable cause because he should have talked to the security guard who he saw conversing with her. And so what we, what I led, forced, guided my students to articulate the analogy. And actually, I didn't have to guide them that far to articulate the analogy. That they did a good job with it. Both the security guards who had the video available and the clown who didn't talk to the security guard who confronted the customer. They both had information available that would exonerate the person accused of shoplifting that they didn't access. And I'm saying that way too long. It could be said more succinctly. But that is the connection, and that would be in the topic sentence. So phrase of pays is or is not that does or does not exist. Probable cause does not exist if the store employee has exonerating information available that they do not consult. Okay? And so we see that very categorical statement. And then later we're laying the foundation for the role application. And that might be one where it's not so obvious. So you might say out loud, like the, like the clown who did not consult the security guard who had talked to the customer, the officers here didn't access available information because they didn't look at the security video to see if the, uh, if the person in the video matched the description of the person they wanted to accuse. So, Seeing that analogy and putting it in that topic sentence in rule explanation, first you lay a foundation for the um, uh, rule application, and second, you make the reader want to read that paragraph because they can see, oh, information, wait, our guy here had information in that video, I bet. You make them uh, see that connection and care about that paragraph if it's a paragraph they care about. And of course, too often, yeah, two, two things I see. One thing I see is people just repeat the rule in the topic sentence. The other thing I see, and yes, then we do the case description. Yeah, I, you can tell I've practiced this a lot. Okay, here's the classic bad topic sentence. In case name, A sued B claiming X, or this happened. Okay, you know, 
somebody sued or somebody got hurt uh, after something happened and then, then there was a lawsuit. But instead, this is a case where um, the client was a fraternity, uh, the, the student's case that they're working on, the client was a fraternity pledge who was being supervised in a drunk room on hell night. He was intoxicated and uh, passed out. And somebody needed to give him a ride the next day and said, let me just take him to my apartment and I'll deal with him. And then left him alone. He woke up in, you know, incoherent, still drunk and got hurt. And this case, the uh, a bus driver dropped somebody off by the side of the road instead of at the park and ride. So do the work for the reader. And this is a breach issue. You breach a duty of care by disregarding a safety precaution established for the protection of the person to whom the duty is owed. And then, so here we've got, phrase and pays exists when you disregard a safety precaution established when legally significant category of facts exists. And I always, this is my big nudge lately. I have too many students who are just repeating the rule as their topic sentence, because of course, rule language is a little categorical and a little abstract, so they think they're there. So I'm pushing, trying to show them the difference. But then we, so I take them through. Here we see the issue and the disposition of the issue. And I'm, I'm, I think you absolutely could articulate this as a formula that you start a case description by saying, court held phrase of pays met when facts, or court held phrase of pays not met when facts. Certainly, it does, you do not necessarily have to have that structure uh, per se, but getting that across efficiently in the first sentence can do a lot for the reader. My, uh, I do have very strong pet peeves. Whenever I see in a case description involved, regarded, or concerned, or dealt with, I know they're wasting my time. Don't tell me what it dealt with, or involved, or regarded. Tell me what they did. They held, they found, they decided, they ruled. Uh, anyway, so here we've got our facts, a little bit more. And here we've got some reasoning, okay? And I, I, you know, one thing, well, gee, what if I have a bunch of cases on the same point? And okay, and sometimes, well, gee, if I have a parenthetical, I don't have to do that, do I? There's no way you can put a, a whole case description in a parenthetical. Sure you can. Issue and disposition of the issue, they breach the duty. Facts, the pledge exhibited signs of alcohol poisoning and the fraternity members ignored safety protocols and did not seek care for him. Now here, there's no reasoning, okay? And that's okay. I, I have seen parentheticals that are also able to slip some reasoning in there. This is a sort of um, a thing where I think the reasoning is almost self-evident, but I also think a lot of times you're okay without the reasoning. It's real, it depends, it depends. Okay, um, I, I welcome uh, questions on um, uh, case descriptions and topic sentences. My theory on topic sentences is that they are, um, what do I want to say? They are the unappreciated stars because the reality is we decide when we read the first sentence of a paragraph, should I bother reading this paragraph or not? And if it doesn't signal strongly the connection to what we care about, the very common behavior is just to skip it. I'm going to just go on and find a paragraph that talks about what I want to talk about. That's why we want to put that phrase of pays in that topic sentence. But, um, uh, and so I, I fuss with topic sentences and I'm, I really, really, really push my students to write effective topic sentences. Likewise, I really think if they can nail that case description formula, they're going to read cases more effectively. They're going to talk about cases more effectively. And the, I think reading cases to look at, um, to look for, the nugget that they can use. Okay, okay, I've, this, I've got a breach issue. What did they say about breach? The real hard thing, uh, for example, that slander case I was telling you about, the court went on and on about how the first security guard who went to the parking lot did have probable cause, but the clown, I now hope you are all picturing him with the bozo here, um, the clown did not have probable cause. And my students kept saying, the probable cause did not transfer from this person to that person. And I kept saying, um, does, do we need to know that? Does that matter to our client? You know, getting them to recognize what's the relevant issue, what's, what are the relevant facts, okay? And to recognize that, oh, I don't need to tell them about that other stuff, even though that was the main point of the case. Yeah, that's great if you're in torts and you're talking about libel and slander and probable cause for shopkeeper's privilege in general. 
that doesn't matter to our client. So that whole relevant issue, disposition for that issue, relevant facts, relevant reasoning, getting them to really zero in and focus on that. Uh, a great exercise to do when I use that formula is very common, as you know, I know, uh, to have a case that is relevant to multiple issues that the students are working on in, in a project. Okay, this half of the room, write a case description for issue A. This half of the room, write a case description for issue B the same case and getting them to recognize the differences, you know, that, oh, this is going to be a different focus because we're talking about a different issue in a different part of the, um, a different part of the court opinion. All right. Um, my next organizational template, I'm, uh, uh, my next formula, sorry, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because I'm guessing it is something that you, these concepts are something you are all familiar with. I am, um, I'm a big fan of what I call positions of emphasis. And I also, I consider that I teach behavioral legal writing because, you know, just as I was saying a moment ago, we read the first sentence of a paragraph and decide, do I want to bother reading this paragraph? That's human behavior. That's reader behavior. And we have to write in a way that we are aware of the reader behavior and we, you know, um, meet that demands, that the meet, meet the demands that the reader has. Well, if we pick up a document and we're scanning through it now on the computer or flipping through it on paper, what are the what are the opportunities to grab attention? Where are they looking? And so my theory, if you have do a good job on this, these what I call template items, your reader is going to be a lot happier, even if you've chosen a crazy ass organization. If these all make sense, your reader will be able to follow your analysis and they'll be able to know what's going on. And so just having headings, it makes sense, doing a good job on roadmap paragraphs, doing a good job on your topic thesis sentences, and making sure that each section ends with an effective connection conclusion. That's going to help the reader um, uh, use that document a lot more effectively. Yeah, I talk about readers, people who are reading sequentially, users. Users have an agenda. Where's the raise of discussion? Where's the breach discussion? And we've got to write in a way that both readers are satisfied because it makes sense, it's linear, it follows, and users are helped. I can find that raise of section. I can find that breach section. I can find the discussion of the Beasley case or the Smith case or whatever I'm looking for. So um, using these signals to the reader can make a big difference. Okay, I am, oh man, I have like three minutes left and I could get to my beta formulas. I'm going to get to my beta formulas. This is, and I'm sure, if Monty, if you are watching this, please, if I have um, misstated, because I'm sure some of this comes from you with the conclusion thesis. Um, and a lot of this, the labels just help us check, is it there? If you have these binary questions to ask, you can make it a lot more effective. And so I'm calling CR paragraphs that first paragraph after adding. It's either conclusion thesis plus rule or rule plus conclusion thesis. It can be in either order. The catch is that where it's labeled important is that sometimes it's going to be more than like two sentences. Sometimes we got to start with the Fourth Amendment and then get down to reasonable expectation of privacy. And so this is why I say the formula is just the sort of structure on which we hang more knowledge. So yeah, it's got to have CR, but that R might not just be one sentence. So here is my fraternity boy again um, uh, case, and I have them find. So here's our conclusion thesis. There's the general rule about duty, but here is the specific rule that we have at issue in this case. Okay, so we that is a CR paragraph. It's a little longer. Okay, this one. Oh, where's the conclusion thesis? Up, oh, it's not there. And what happens, I've been guilty of this myself, I put the conclusion thesis in the heading and I forget to put it in the body. And of course, the problem is a lot of readers skip the headings when they are reading in a linear way. So we've got to make sure we put it there. There's our conclusion thesis. There's our general rule about breach and a definition of due care. And here's a more narrow statement of the rule that's relevant to the client's case. And then finally, just here's a really simple one. Oh, wow. When this got transferred to your system, Natalie, it looks like some of my uh, quotation marks went weird. So apologies. Here's our conclusion thesis and here's our rule. This is just a very straightforward CR paragraph. Um, okay, now this one I'm excited about. How long should this be? Here is sort of a basic uh, discussion, okay? A student said to me once, what page limit should I aim for? 
And that proves my point about page limits, that uh, too many people turn them into goals. When they have a page limit, it becomes a goal. And well, if the page limit is 20, I better have at least 18 or I'm, I'm not being a good person. And I realized that I don't think in pages when I'm, I'm teaching legal writing for the pieces of CREXAC and the pieces of a discussion section, we have the umbrella before we get to any CREXAC unit of discourse or CREAC unit of discourse, I'm thinking in terms of paragraphs. So this is, this is, this is fresh off uh, uh, the uh, assembly line. When my students were working on their final draft of their first memo, I had gotten a few, how long should this be? And I sent them this. And so I'm gonna return to my little illustration. When, she should it be, when I say occasionally more, should I do two, at least two paragraphs? Should it be more than two paragraphs? Should it be more in my application than one to two paragraphs? Well, this is one of the things that depends on. How controversial is this particular piece of it? How abstract is the language in this particular piece of it? Absolutely, there are more things that can depend on. But this is a baby formula. This is where I am right now. So anyway, all right. I'm at 146. So I uh, I have been a good person and followed my time limit. So um, I would love to hear uh, other questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, like it was said, we have entered our Q&A portion. So if there are any questions, feel free to type it out and I will read it out loud. Uh, why don't we get started? Um, so first question is, are you, and I believe you sort of answered this, are you worried about the writing are you worried the writing will be too cookie cutter or boring if yeah, students use this? I, I did, I have addressed that because I, I that's absolutely something. I know, um, uh, you know, yeah, have easily wants to suck all the creativity out of me. No, the creativity is seeing that a videotape, looking at a videotape is like talking to a guy who has just uh, had an interaction with a suspected shoplifter. That seeing that connection is where the creativity is. The creativity is not leaving the reader. I always say suspense is the enemy of good legal writing. The creativity doesn't come from that. And I, like many of many of us in legal writing, I've created um, uh, criteria sheets, rubrics, whatever. And I will never forget when a dean, actually at that point he was a retired dean, um, saw my rubric and he said, he looked at it and he said, well, don't they all just write the same thing? Um, uh, when you give them that, and I'm seeing Chelsea's comment, you're exactly right. Don't they all just write the same thing? And I burst out laughing. I said, you know, in my dreams. Um, uh, and, you know, when I think about what am I aiming for, if I can get students to articulate their rule, to finish explaining their rule before they apply it and then apply it, that is that is my dream. Now, how effectively they explain, how effectively they apply, are they talking about the right issues? All of those things are part of the mix. But if I can get them to separate that rule explanation from that rule application, oh boy, I'm in heaven. But the pieces of it, you know, it's like, well, well, houses are all made of, you know, upright structures and things at right angles, you know, so that's so boring. No, that is how structure works. The variety comes in through a different opening. Great. Thank you for diving deeper. Um, next sort of comment as well is I think that's one of the hardest things to get through to students is the C and R. Don't need to be single sentences and they have no problem seeing it with yeah. E and A, but they seem to have them. Yeah. Different. And I, um, the one of the first books and that example I showed you was from writing an analysis in the law. That was one of the first books to annotate samples. And I, um, uh, do not have any of these slides, but what I have often, I often do this exercise that I call the self-graded draft and the wonderful Tom Blackwell uh, used it and called it the rainbow review, where I, you know, I think one of the things we're doing in teaching is we're attaching what, you know, what Terry Pullman would call jargon or vocabulary to reality. So I have them mark in the margin where did you state the rule? Where did you explain the rule? Where did you apply the rule? And I have them use highlighters and I have alternatives for people who have color blindness issues. Um, highlight the phrase it pays or what most people call key terms. Highlight the phrase it pays in pink. Highlight the client facts in blue. Highlight citations in green. And there are certain things that are markers of 
the rule. It's not 100%, but it's like, gee, if I see a lot of this together, then if I see a lot of facts and phrase of pays together, that should be rule application, you know, so the colors can help you find things. But what I find is for my stronger students, that exercise teaches them and they're like, oh my God, I never said my rule out loud because I can't, you know, find it to market. For my weaker students, it's very illuminating to me because they will mark something as an explanation and I'll think, oh honey, that's what you think an explanation is. But it's good because then it isolates it and I know what they're having trouble with. Um, oh, I'm just looking at uh, Karen's comment here. I've been using word count complete with a sample demonstrating exactly how long everything should be. Um, yeah. Dancing with the stars, no personalization until you learn the steps. Yeah, they used to in um, uh, in figure skating in the Olympics, they used to make the figure skaters do figure eights because it was a skill to, uh, you know, if you could do a figure eight, then you would be able to do many of the other things that figure skaters have to do. Now they don't make them uh, do those figures anymore. But I think of sort of the foundational stuff as figure eights. And I actually have on some of my criteria sheets do they follow an analytical method that gets the information that the reader needs? You know, the reader always needs to know what rule governs the situation they have put before you. They always need to know what that rule means and how the controversial pieces fit together. And they always need to know how it applies to the client's case. The rest is like window dressing, persuasion, that sort of thing. But as I say, we're just talking scaffolding here because there are so many little details that vary. The formula is very bare bones, but how you complete the formula requires thought and sophistication. And I've got to watch Dancing with the Stars now because I've not, that's not one of my shows. I, I've been using Great British Bake Off for when I, I do um, uh, live critiques. I'm like, I, I have yet to shake a student's hand, but um, like Paul Hollywood does, but you know, where Paul Hollywood and, and Prue Leith say negative things, oh, I'm disappointed in this or whatever, they say it to their face and the people have to, have to accept it and learn from it right there. So um, uh, I, I've been told there will be a recording of this session. Of yes, there will be. Yes, it was asked um, if there will be a recording of the session. Yes, there and will Julie, be. Julie, I can only See wonder you. what you did to get booted out. I'm sorry. Um, uh, so I've been, I'm glad I wasn't booted out. I was telling them before it began when I've been Zooming a couple of times, I've been dropped from my own class that I was teaching. <laughs> That's not any fun. Uh, <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I do not see yeah. any more questions at the moment. Um, so I will pass it back over to you for any sort of final remarks. I mean, I know that probably all of you are doing variations on your own um, uh, formulas. And I want to push back on anyone who is anti-formula. And if you, and let me say, if you have faculty member to anti-formula, absolutely you should call it a heuristic because that will that sounds much more sophisticated than a formula um oh i will absolutely provide a quick explanation of phrase of pace so if the statute says um if you are operating a vehicle while intoxicated then you are guilty of dui in ohio or whatever so gee uh this person was sitting in a parked car or no sitting on a motorized bar stool uh, drunk in a parking lot of a uh, bar. Um, gee, were they intoxicated? That's one issue So we have to see what testing happened. Is a motorized bar stool a vehicle and is sitting on a motorized bar stool in a parking lot, is that operating under the statute? So presuming all of those are controversial, we would have three units of discourse. The first one, the phrase of pace would be operating. And we would expect topic sentences like, operating goes beyond uh, you know, being in motion. It's about control of a vehicle. Um, I, and in the section about is a motorized bar stool vehicle, obviously vehicles are phrase of pace. Vehicle is any, oh, I can't think of a generic word, device that, um, uh, any device that can go at more than X miles per hour and has a motor, I know, I don't know. And then intoxicated, we know what intoxicated is. But it is, a lot of people call it the key terms. I truly call it the phrase of pace just because it's more fun. But I find 
that I really, it's a concept I use all the time. Like when students want me to write letters of recommendation or when I do tenure reviews for people, I say, please send me your faculty rules so I can see the phrases that pay, you know, where it says this person has made a major contribution to their field. Then I know I have to say in my letter, this article made a major contribution to the field of legal writing because it did blah, 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 blah. So um, it is, is purely just a, a more fun way to say key terms. Um, but yeah, the other thing I will say about uh, pushing back on, uh, on heuristics or pushing back on formulas, the other thing, the, the uh, self-graded draft exercise where they highlight and everything and then mark things in the margin. So when I talk to my friends in legal writing, I refer to it as the highlighting exercise. When I talk to non-legal writing people who are snobby about legal writing, not to the wonderful people I, who are my colleagues now and have been my colleagues at many other schools who understand and appreciate how important it is, I refer to, the, to it not as a highlighting exercise, but as a metacognitive exercise. Both are correct. Um, both are absolutely valid descriptions of it, but metacognitive, oh, oh, that's, that's, that's about the brain, isn't it? Yeah. Because, and, and I think a lot of times what I'm doing with all these labels and that metacognitive, oh my God, that's what you think a rule is. That's so enlightening to me to see where the student gets to, yes, this is what I think a rule is and they get to mark it. It really shows me uh, what's going on in their heads. Just like another metacognitive thing I do is I have students, now I'm calling them sidebars. Writing is a series of decisions when they have a problem doing something. I say, drop me a sidebar, you know, drop me a comment in the margin and tell me what you're having trouble with. And they'll write, well, how many cases should I cite here? I have like 10 cases that have the same result. Should I cite them all? And that really helps me. When are they having trouble making a decision? I want them to, to capture the moment of discomfort rather than me saying in the conference, gee, I didn't understand why you did this. And then they don't remember because it was last week or two weeks ago or whenever. And so they don't know why they did what they did. So I really try to encourage them to capture the moments of confusion and tell me about them, not on final drafts, but on, uh, on earlier drafts so that um, I can help them make those decisions in the future. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much again for your presentation today. Um, today's webinar has ended, so I want to thank you all for attending, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I appreciate it.